Here is your latest African news. South Africa. Thousands of ANC members call for Ramaphosa's resignation. Former ANC and EC member Carl Niehaus has called for President Cyril Ramaphosa to step down amid the Fala Fala controversy. Niehaus and former Northwest Premier Supra Mahuma Pelo, alongside the RET's Ngosen Shazi, teaming crowds marched towards the ANC's headquarters. The protest came underway with the hashtag Cyril must go and hashtag Cyril must resign trending on social media and the president came under nationwide scrutiny after former spy boss Arthur Frazier leaked information about a robbery that had taken place at Ramaphosa's Fala Fala farm in Limpompo. The EFF said it will lead a campaign to oust Ramaphosa from his position as head of the ANC and South Africa. East Africa Kenya and Somalia agree to reopen borders after successful bilateral talks. Kenya will resume flights to Mogadishu, Somalia, effective immediately. This comes on the back of successful bilateral talks between Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta and Somalia's Hassan Muhammad in Nairobi on July 15th. According to a joint communique by the country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Kenya Airways KQ will begin scheduled flights to the capital Mogadishu in lieu of the existing bilateral air service agreement BASA. Somalia has also allowed the resumption of Mirage trade, fish and fish products in a bid to defrost diplomatic tensions between the two countries and enhanced trade cooperation. Both countries will also process visas for ordinary passport holders within 10 working days and issue free courtesy visas on arrival for dignitaries and diplomats. Uganda American missionary jailed for defiling Ugandan girl. An American missionary has been sentenced to 10 years after a U.S. court found him guilty of defiling a 14-year-old local girl under his care in Uganda's eastern district of Mbale. Eric Twinaga, 45, was also ordered to pay $20,000 in restitution to the victim and spend a lifetime in supervised release as a registered sex offender after serving his term. Twinaga pleaded guilty in February and was taken to jail pending sentencing. South Africa Koi and Son receive historic payout for traditional knowledge. Descendants of what may well be the oldest of the world's first peoples, the Khoi and Son of southwestern Africa, have begun to receive payouts for their traditional knowledge from proceeds of sale of the globally famous rooibos tea. In the first payment of its kind, about 720,000 US dollars has been paid to a trust as a percent of sales for the increasingly popular beverage. Rooibos is a slender stalk-like plant which grows abundantly in the far south and southwestern region of Africa. Dried under the sun, the plant reddens and subsequently is cut into small pieces suitable for making a caffeine-free beverage. Rooibos tea is catching on rapidly worldwide as health-conscious people seeking alternative to traditional tea or coffee buy up the aromatic and health-supporting beverage. Mali Mali suspends all new UN peacekeeping rotations. Mali has suspended all new rotations of the United Nations MINUSMA peacekeeping mission, including those already scheduled for national security reasons, the foreign ministry said. The suspension that started on July 15th will last until a meeting is held to facilitate the coordination and regulation of the rotation of the contingents, it said in a statement. The announcement came four days after the Malian authorities arrested 49 Ivorian soldiers it later described as mercenaries intent on toppling the country's military-led government. Ivory Coast says the soldiers were so-called National Support Elements, NSE, a UN procedure allowing contingents of peacekeeping missions to call on outside contractors for logistical duties. Malawi Chinese man extradited to Malawi over racist videos Authorities in Zambia have extradited a Chinese citizen who fled Malawi last month over accusations of selling exploitative videos to China of Malawian children. Police in Malawi stated that their counterparts in Zambia handed over Lu Ki to them on July 16th in the Mchinji district, which borders Zambia. The videos could be bought for up to $70 on Chinese social media and internet platforms. Malawi's Attorney General Thambo Chakaka Nyerenda confirmed that he had been extradited. He added that the Chinese citizen is due to appear in court on July 18th in line with procedures after someone had been arrested. Somalia. Plane crash lands at airport in Somalia's capital. All passengers survive. Juba Airways plane carrying passengers from the town of Baidoa crash landed at Aden Ade International Airport in Somalia's capital Mogadishu on July 19th and all those on board survived, Somali state media reported. 
Smoke billowing into the sky could be seen after the plane crashed near the airport's fence. Firefighters reached the scene immediately to deduce flames after part of the aircraft caught fire. No fatalities have been reported and passengers appeared to be safe after being rescued. Debris clearing was underway at the airport and the crash scene was sealed off by African Union peacekeepers. Somali authorities and Juba Airways have not yet established the cause of the crash. Africa Wide AU selects Rwanda to host the HQ of New African Medicines Agency. Rwanda has been selected to host the headquarters of the African Medicines Agency, AMA, by the Executive Council of the African Union, AU, at a meeting held in the Zambian capital of Lusaka on July 18th. The council agreed that AMA will enhance the capacity of AU state parties and the continent's regional economic communities, RECs, to regulate medical products and to improve Africa's access to quality, safe and efficacious medical products. Rwanda had submitted an expression of interest in hosting the AMA headquarters along with Uganda, Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, Tanzania, Tunisia, Zimbabwe, as Health Policy Watch reported in June. After the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, AMA will be second specialized health agency of the continental body. The 55 member states hope to foster an enabling environment for pharmaceutical manufacturing thanks to this new body. The COVID-19 outbreak exacerbated challenges the health sector faces on the continent. Indeed, AMA comes after a long journey which started in 2009 with the establishment of the African Medicines Regulatory Harmonization Initiative, AMRH. On July 17th, the AUC chairperson and chairperson of each REC convened under the AU theme of the year 2022, Building Resilience and Nutrition on the African Continent, Accelerate the Human Capital, Social and Economic Development. South Africa Six lions from Hululue Infolozi Park in KwaZulu-Natal have been euthanized after killing six cows and terrorizing residents. As Mvolo Kaiserden Wildlife said residents in Kulwane and Okuko feared walking in the areas at night. The lions were killed on July 15th, according to Ezemvolo Kaiserden Wildlife spokesperson Musa Mtambo. The six lions had killed six cows before they were destroyed, and the figure of cows killed may raise as some community members still have not taken stock of their cows. The community had been recently living in fear of their lives, which made them even scared of venturing to the area they use as pastures for their livestock. The community's anger was rising as it was feared that the lions had lost fear of human beings. Several community members had alleged that they had come into contact with these lions and instead of lions running away, which is their normal behavior, they walked straight towards them, forcing them to retreat. Horn of Africa. Sudan reopens border crossing with Ethiopia. Sudan on July 17th announced the reopening of the border crossing with Ethiopia, citing confiding building measures by Addis Ababa. After the collapse of the al-Bashir regime in April 2019, relations between Sudan and Ethiopia remained stained due to cross-border attacks by the Amhara militiamen. Accordingly, the Sudan authorities closed and reopened the strategic crossing several times. In a statement, the Sudanese army spokesman said the Technical Committee of the Security and Defense Council, chaired by the head of the Sovereign Council, decided to open the Galabar crossing point. On July 5th, Al-Burhan and Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed agreed to form a joint committee to end the border dispute between the two countries. Ethiopia. U.S. Egypt reiterates support for Egypt's water security, forging diplomatic resolution on GERD. Following a meeting between President Joe Biden and his Egyptian counterpart Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia on July 17th, the two leaders issued a joint statement in which the U.S. and Egypt discussed, among others, to promote regional stability. One of the issues the two leaders discussed is the issue of Ethiopia's Grand Renaissance Dam, GERD. 
President Biden reiterated U.S. support for Egypt's water security and to forging a diplomatic resolution that would achieve the interests of all parties and contribute to a more peaceful and prosperous region, the statement said. In June this year, Ethiopia objected a similar stance taken by the European Union expressing the bloc's support to Egypt's water security. Mozambique Mozambique set to commence exportation of liquid gas. Mozambique's Ministry of Mineral Resources and Energy has announced that the Coral South project has begun pumping natural gas into its floating platform in Area 4 of the Rovuma Basin off the coast of the northern province of Cabo Delgado, thus paving the way for the first export of liquefied natural gas LNG later this year. Six undersea natural gas wells were connected to the platform in May. On board, the gas will be liquefied and then pumped into the vessels that will ship it to the customer markets. Cited in his ministry's statement, the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, Carlos Zacharias, said that achieving this latest landmark puts Mozambique on the map of countries producing LNG. The platform has the capacity of liquefying 3.4 million tons of natural gas a year. The gas comes from the Coral Reservoir, where there are estimated reserves of 450 billion cubic meters. The platform is 432 meters long and 66 meters wide. Diaspora Affordable housing for young Dominicans launched. Young residents of Dominica who are looking to invest in their own homes will be able to do so at a less expensive rate. This is what Dominica's Prime Minister, Roosevelt Skerritt, promised as he announced on July 16th the government's future housing program. This is where affordable housing will be made more accessible to qualified residents who are 45 years or younger and are employed within the public and private sectors. The program would also eventually be expanded for the rest of Dominica's citizens and residents. Housing projects are being taken seriously in Dominica and its government is working non-stop to build back better for its residents and eventually become the world's first climate resilient country. These projects are mostly funded by the highly acclaimed Dominica Citizenship by Investment CBI program which has been in operation since 1993. To date, thousands of houses are already being turned over to beneficiaries and more projects are ongoing to provide more climate-resilient homes for the most vulnerable. Africa-wide, African nations meet on critical nature conservation. Delegates across Africa on July 18th in Rwanda launched the first continent-wide gathering about the role of protected areas in ensuring the future of our planet. The IUC and Africa Protected Areas Congress, APAC, is being held just a few months before the COP15 summit in December when global leaders are aiming to adopt a much-delayed pact to shield nature from the damage brought by human activity. Organizers said APAC will aim to shape the role of protected and conserved areas in safeguarding Africa's wildlife, delivering vital ecosystem services and promoting sustainable development while conserving the continent's cultural heritage and traditions. Last month, the UN Conservation on Biological Diversity's 196 members held negotiations on the draft global biodiversity framework in Nairobi, but made only limited progress in ironing out differences. At the heart of the COP15 draft treaty is a provision to designate 30% of Earth's land area and ocean as protected zones by 2030. More than 90 world leaders have signed a pledge over the past two years to reserve nature loss by then, saying the interconnected threats of biodiversity loss and climate change are a planetary emergency. Kenya. Rare twin giraffes born at Kenyan Park. Rare twin giraffes have been born at the Nairobi National Park, Wildlife and Tourism Cabinet Secretary Najib Balala has said. The CS on July 19th took to Twitter to celebrate the news. The incident last happened in October 2014 when a tour operator, Andreas Norzenberg, captured the birth during a safari in the Maasai Mara National Reserve. The tour operator described the moment he and his tour group spotted the giraffe giving birth as special. According to experts, the twinning rates in giraffe is one in every 2,800,000. This explains the phenomenon that there are a whole lot more human twins in the world than there are giraffes in zoos globally. So rare are twin births for giraffes that experts report that out of 8,600 normal births worldwide, there are less than 40 twin births. Ivory Coast 
activist anger over Ivory Coast polygamy proposal. Women's rights activists in Ivory Coast have expressed anger over a proposed bill that will legalize polygamy for men, calling it a step backwards in the fight for equality. Polygamy was outlawed in Ivory Coast in 1964. It's prohibited in many parts of the world but remains widespread in West African countries. Rights groups say Ivorian women face systematic inequalities and discrimination. The United Nations Commission on Human Rights considers the practice discriminatory against women and has called for its eradication. The bill has to be reviewed by the Constitution court before it can be put to a vote in Parliament. Africa wide. Uganda, Botswana and Ghana are the world's top three economies with the most female entrepreneurs. The 2021 MasterCard Index of Women Entrepreneurs has for the third consecutive year ranked Botswana at 38.5%, Uganda at 38.4% and Ghana at 37.2% as the countries with the most women business owners globally. The index benchmark indicator is calculated as a percentage of total business owners. This is the fifth edition of the program which puts the spotlight on the significant socioeconomic contribution of women entrepreneurs around the world including Africa and provides insight on the fact factors driving and inhibiting their advancement. In many African countries, women advancement is hampered by less supportive entrepreneurial conditions, a lack of funding, less opportunities for high-level education, as well as structural barriers. Despite the challenges presented by the pandemic and economic downturn, MasterCard's research indicates that women entrepreneurs in Africa are resilient and adaptable, particularly those in low- and middle-income economies, often suppressing men in terms of entrepreneurial activities. Mozambique. Mozambique delays verdict in Tuna Bond scandal trial. A court in Mozambique has delayed for three months the verdict in the biggest corruption trial in the country's history. The scandal involves more than $2.7 billion of undisclosed state debts, money that the government borrowed to set up a sophisticated tuna industry to buy trawlers and military patrol boats, but much of it was allegedly diverted to corrupt officials. Those accused include Ndambi Nguibiza, son of former President Armando Nguibiza, and 18 others. They were charged with blackmail, embezzlement, and money laundering. The younger Nguibiza, denied the charges and said the accusations were politically motivated. The verdict was due for 1st August but has now been pushed back to 30th November. Judge Efigenio Baptista cited the complexity of the case and the huge volume of evidence amounting to 30,000 pages as the reason for the delay. The trial started in August last year on the grounds of a maximum security prison on the outskirts of the capital Maputo. Kenya. Archaeologists discover millet buried 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists have discovered millet they say was buried 2,000 years ago in Teso North sub-county Busia. The discovery was made after a series of research undertakings by U.S. and Kenyan archaeologists who had collected seed samples at the Kakapel National Monument and Cultural Center in Teso North. The lead researcher in an interview said the findings will help communities in Busia and Kenya to understand the feeding ways of ancient man by the time the samples were excavated under a rock in Kakapel. The finger millet had approximately 250 seeds out of the about 500 seeds excavated to facilitate the study. The remaining seeds were from various local grass species. The finger millet seeds were excavated underneath one of the caves at the Kakapel rock that is estimated to be 270 meters high. The discovery, according to the local community, may open up tourist activities in Kakapel, which they said on Friday can benefit the area. Kakapel Monument and Cultural Center Deputy Curator Anthony Odero said the findings are an eye-opener, particularly to the local community, which he called upon to preserve ancient lifestyles, millet, or derosaid, is a fruit crop that should be adopted for cultivation not only in Kakapel but across the country because of its health benefits. Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's Munangawa slams foreign interference ahead of next year's election. President Emerson Mnangawa has said when the country reaches the home stretch to general elections next year, he has noted worrisome and meddlesome tendencies from foreign missions accredited to the country. Mnangawa wrote in the state-run Sunday Mail that his government frowns upon the brazen effrontery against the country's sovereignty, which is in clear violation of basic provisions of international law governing interstate relations. He claimed that there was a gross disdain for sovereignty and that the worrisome propensity is likely to get even more blatant close to Zimbabwe's harmonized general elections slated for next year. Besides banning foreign journalists from working in Zimbabwe in the past, the country has no record of deporting diplomats. Ghana 
Ghana to sign $3.2 billion railway project deal with Thelo DB Consortium. Ghana's government will sign an agreement next week with Thelo DB Consortium for a $3.2 billion project to develop and make operational its Western Railway line. The company said in a statement on July 19th, Thelo DB is a South African railway entity incorporated between Thelo Ventures, an African industrial company, and Germany's Deutsches Bahn Engineering and Consulting. The Thelo DB Consortium also includes Ghanaian partner Transtech Consult. Ghana's Western Railway line runs a total of 339 kilometers from Takoradi port to Kumasi, but only 66 kilometers is operational, according to the website of Ghana's Ministry of Railways Development, where it is listed as a priority project. Two mines are on the route, including the Ghana Manganese Mine at Nsuta and Bokshite Mine at Awaso, which used to use the railway until it collapsed, according to the ministry. The line also goes through Ghana's cocoa growing region, and, and cocoa used to be transported in significant quantities by rail, but has not not been since 2006. Transportation of cement, mining equipment and petroleum will also benefit from construction of the rail line, the ministry added. The agreement will be signed on July 25th at a ceremony with President Nana Akufuado, the company said. Diaspora Judge concludes school slavery punishment assignment does not violate rights, causing outrage. A federal judge has ruled in favor of the Sun Prairie School District regarding a lawsuit filed by two black parents. Their children's middle school, located in Wisconsin, handed out an assignment that asked students how they punished a slave in ancient Mesopotamia, and they believed it was harmful and inappropriate. Irvins and Priscilla Jones also say the Black History Month assignment in February 2021 violated their civil rights and their children's. After an internal investigation, it was discovered that three teachers devised the assignment themselves as the question was not included in the school district's curriculum on ancient Mesopotamia. The question appeared on a 6th grade homework question at Patrick Marsh Middle School and was given to students on the first day of Black History Month. It read, and I quote, A slave stands before you. This slave has disrespected his master by telling him, You're not my master. How will you punish the slave? End quote. The question read. The assignment said the answer was, and I quote, According to Hammurabi's code, put to death, end quote. It quickly led to online outrage. The teachers were placed on administrative leave and ultimately resigned, though a decision has been made in federal court. Complaints that the district violated state law will be reviewed by Dane County Circuit Court. Africa-wide, migrants sentenced in Morocco for illegal entry. The court in Nador, near the North African Kingdom's border with Melilla, has sentenced 33 migrants to 11 months behind bars each. At least 23 migrants died after around 2,000 people, many from Sudan, stormed the frontier on June 24th, the worst death toll in years of attempted migrant crossing into Spain, Ceuta and Melilla enclaves, which represents the EU's only land borders with Africa. The 33 irregular migrants were prosecuted for illegal entry onto Moroccan soil, violence against law enforcement officers, participating in an armed gathering and refusing to obey orders, according to a court statement. Spanish rights group Camicando Fronteras says as many as 37 people lost their lives in the June 24th incident. The United Nations, the African Union and independent rights groups have condemned the use of excessive force by Moroccan and Spanish security personnel. Morocco's state-backed CNDH rights group said last week that those who died likely suffocated. Nigeria Buhari announces shakeup in Nigeria's oil industry. Nigeria's state-run oil corporation has formally become a commercial company. The new entity, the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited, was unveiled by President Muhammadu Buhari on Tuesday in the capital Abuja. The government hopes the conversion of the state-owned oil company to a commercial one will attract more foreign investment to the oil sector. President Buhari said the new company would deliver value to more than 200 million Nigerians. Last year, after two decades of trying, a new law was passed to allow the privatization of the company and an overhaul of the oil sector. Nigeria is one of Africa's leading oil producers, but its citizens say they have benefited little from the wealth. Anti-corruption campaigners have long asked for more transparency and accountability in the Nigerian oil industry. 
West Africa. Togo begins mediation on detained Ivorian soldiers. Robert Dersey, the foreign minister of Togo, met with representatives of Ivory Coast on July 19th in Abidjan to discuss the case of 49 Ivorian troops. This comes 48 hours after the Mali junta leader requested Togo to lead a mission between the two nations to assist resolve the problem. According to a statement, Dazi stated that the leaders of the Malian Junta and the president of Ivory Coast both desired to maintain peace between their countries. The statement also said that President Alassane Ouattara thanked the minister for taking the initiative to find a solution to the problem. Goiter said in order to maintain good ties between Mali and the Ivory Coast, he was ready to cooperate to settle the conflict. Somaliland Somaliland suspends BBC for undermining the state. Authorities in Somaliland, a breakaway region in Somalia, on Tuesday suspended the operations of the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, accusing the broadcaster of undermining the credibility of the Somaliland state. The BBC broadcasts radio bulletins in the Somali language and has a network of journalists operating across Somalia, including in Hargeisa. Somaliland declared independence from Somalia during the 1991 civil war and has thrived as a comparative beacon of stability but is not diplomatically recognized by any other nation. Somalia fiercely opposes Somaliland's claims to independence and considers the region part of its territory, though in reality Mogadishu exercises little authority over its affairs. South Africa Methanol found in blood of South African tavern victims. The toxic chemical methanol has been identified as a possible cause of the death of 21 teenagers at a bar in the South African city of East London last month. Methanol was found in all of their bodies and investigations are continuing to determine whether the levels of the toxic chemical were enough to have killed them. Authorities are still awaiting the conclusive results, which are being conducted at a laboratory in the city of Cape Town. Methanol is a toxic form of alcohol that is used industrially as a solvent, pesticide or an alternative source of fuel. It is not used in the production of alcohol sold for human consumption. It is yet not known how the youngsters ingested the methanol. Alcohol poisoning and inhalation of carbon monoxide have both been ruled out as possible causes of death, although traces of both were detected in the bodies of all 21 victims. Namibia signs deal to relocate cheetahs to India. India has come one step closer to bringing back the world's fastest animal, which has been extinct in the country since 1952, with an agreement that was signed in Delhi between the government and the visiting Namibian Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of International Relations, Netumbo Nandi Ndaitwa. The agreement, which has been negotiated for some years, will prepare the ground for the relocation of the fast batch of cheetahs from Southern Africa to Madhya Pradesh Kuno National Park, with officials trying to complete the fast transfer before August 15th. The MOU focused on biodiversity conservation and the sharing of expertise between the two countries, technological applications, collaborations on climate change, pollution and waste management, and the exchange of personnel for training and education in wildlife management. DRC Congo DR Congo to auction drilling rights in rainforest the Democratic Republic of Congo says it will auction rights to drill for oil in more than two dozen areas, including a rainforest region that green groups say should be protected. 27 blocks for oil exploration and three for gas will be auctioned off from 28th July, the Minister of Hydrocarbons Didia Budimbu announced. On the 27 oil blocks, three are located in the coast of the Congo River Basin and nine in the huge Central Basin rainforest region in the west of the country. The other 15 are in the east of the country near the Albert and Tanganyika Great Lakes. The three gas blocks are located at Lake Kivu, also in the east. Environmental campaigners have protested against plans to drill in the Central Basin. Oil prospecting there, which will include the cutting of huge corridors to transport equipment, could have a disastrous impact on the rare species and unleash carbon that has lain undisturbed for thousands of years, they say. Africa Wide 
U.S. President Joe Biden seeks to strengthen political, economic alliances with Africa. After the 27th February UN General Assembly vote on Russia-Ukraine, which tested Africa's political and military alliances, U.S. President Joe Biden will in December meet some of the African leaders who chose to abstain from voting in person. 17 of the 54 African countries chose to sit on the fence, eight abstained and only Eritrea openly sided with Russia in what the U.S. calls Putin's war on Ukraine. With a clear indication, the U.S. is competing for Africa's attention while Russia and China are also pushing their separate interests. Biden will seek to mend fences, strengthen and hopefully make new friends when he hosts about 50 African leaders in Washington at the US-Africa Leaders Summit which will be held from 13th to 15th December. Kenya Facebook slammed for gagging Kenyan whistleblower Dozens of rights groups and campaigners have signed a letter calling on Facebook to drop all attempts to silence whistleblower Daniel Mortang. They accuse the tech giant of trying to crush his efforts to improve labor conditions for Facebook moderators in Kenya and around the world. Mr. Mortang says he was paid about $2.20 per hour by Sama, one of Facebook's contractors, to review posts including beheadings and child abuse. He's suing both firms in a Kenyan court. In response, both Sama and Facebook applied for a gag order order on Mr. Motang, saying that he could prejudice the outcome of the case by talking to the media. Facebook and its parent company Meta have not responded to the letter, which was signed by Facebook whistleblower Francis Hogan, author Shoshana Zoboff, and the African Freedom of Information Center, among others. Uganda Uganda rejects compulsory adult vaccines a proposed new law to make vaccines compulsory for all adults in the event of a mass disease outbreak has been rejected by Uganda's parliament. The health ministry said the bill was designed to tackle emerging health threats like hemorrhagic fevers and wanted any rule breakers to be fined $1,045 or face a six-month jail sentence. But MPs raised concerns about the rights of individuals to choose and questioned who would take liability for vaccine side effects. Uganda is currently struggling to meet its target of vaccinating 22 million people, about half its population, against COVID-19. Routine vaccination of children against communicable diseases remains mandatory, but in the case of new emerging diseases, the permission of their parents is required. Zimbabwe Chinese embassy in Zimbabwe accused of bullying media Zimbabwe's media alliance has condemned the Chinese embassy in Harare for threatening a weekly newspaper after it published articles on violation by Chinese mining companies. The group says the embassy threatened an unspecified coercive retaliation against the standard newspaper, which the coalition called an attack on press freedom. Nigel Nyamutumbu, head of the media alliance, said the Chinese embassy did not specify the retribution they would take against the newspaper in question, and this was a concern, especially from a global powerhouse in the mold of China. China. Masunda said his organization will continue to report accurately and fairly in Zimbabwe. Rwanda UK Ambassador Disowns Memo on Rwanda Asylum Plan the UK High Commissioner to Rwanda, Omar Dair, has disowned a memo sent to the Home Office advising against any asylum deal with the country. The memo had criticized Rwanda's human rights record and heavy-handed security, according to documents from the Home Office presented to court by lawyers for those challenging the policy. On July 20th, Mr. Dair said the memo was written by his predecessor two months before he began in the post. Britain announced in April an agreement with Rwanda to send some of its migrants there for processing instead, but no one has has yet been flown out because of a series of legal challenges. Angola Children of Jose Eduardo dos Santos accept that his remains be buried in Angola. The family of former Angolan President Jose Eduardo dos Santos has agreed on the place of his burial. The dos Santos children have agreed that their father will be buried in Luanda, Angola, but only after the general elections on August 24th. Since the death of the former Angolan president on July 8th, the family had been arguing with the Angolan authorities who wanted a burial to be held in the country so that the people would pay tribute to him. Jose Eduardo dos Santos, who died at the age of 79, made history after serving as Angola's president for 30 years until 2017. In a letter written by the Dos Santos children addressed to the current Angolan leader, João Lorenco, the family expressed deep gratitude to the Angolan people while asking for respect of the African traditions that impose the respect of a time of mourning. They also asked not to be targeted after the funeral. Zimbabwe Victoria Falls reportedly risks losing World Heritage Site status from UN. 
There are fears the Victoria Falls could be delisted as a World Heritage Site following massive construction activities in the side of the Zambezi River, which might have tampered with some animal corridors and natural sites. These have been carried out on either sides of the Zambezi River between Zambia and Zimbabwe since the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, added Victoria Falls to that list in 1989. This was based on its unique geomorphological formation and remarkable natural beauty. UNESCO is assessing if the destination still qualifies as a World Heritage Site. As the custodian of these sites, UNESCO recently sent a monitoring team to assess the current state of Victoria Falls and its environs. The UN body has the mandate to carry periodic assessments. Zambia's National Commission Secretary General for UNESCO, Charles Ndakala, led the monitoring team. He mentioned possible outcomes, which includes downgrading, red listing, or removing from the list. Victoria Falls' falling water blanket is about 1.7 km meters wide and the falls 108 meters down the gorge and is classified as the largest waterfall in the world. The waterfall is within Victoria Falls National Park which together with the Victoria Falls Bridge attract a significant number of tourists annually. Diaspora Banana workers from Latin America have said pesticides used by US companies made them sterile. Tens of thousands of former banana workers say they were made sterile by a pesticide used by U.S. companies on plantations in Latin America in the 1970s. The United States restricted and then banned its use on the U.S. mainland because of the health risks, but workers in Central America and South America continue to be exposed to it. Grace Livingstone reports from Panama on the workers' decades-long battle for justice. Standard fruit, now known as doll fruit, began using DBCP on banana plantations in Latin America in the the 1960s, while Chiquita and Del Monte began in the early 1970s. According to a lawsuit lodged in U.S. courts, Dole and Chiquita continued to use DBCP in Central America after 1977, even though U.S. regulators had restricted its use in mainland U.S. because of the health risks. In that year, 35 workers at a DBCP manufacturing plant in Latin America were found to be sterile. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, follow, share and like our video. It's the best way of supporting us and remember, Africa is watching.